All right, guys, we are live on Saturday morning, bright and early here, bright and early being 9 a.m., and I'm going to forewarn you that today's session or today's <laughs> chat might have some whining and uh, complaining in the background. That's going to be my puppy, Shmuley. So what I want to do is I want to introduce him to you and um, just briefly bring him on camera. Thank God I've got my beautiful wife, Janet, who's going to help me because I could not do this alone. Um, I'll, I'll just show him to you. I'll introduce him to you. Then I'll take questions. And uh, you know the things I don't want to answer are going to be things like, you know, where the, who the breeder is and all those kind of things. Cause I just, I don't recommend breeders. I've got, I found a very, very, very amazing breeder. Um, as I did with Goofy, I got very, very lucky. And, um, and I'll talk to you about how I, fi how I would suggest finding a breeder and all those things. That'll be a lot, a lot of great topics for discussion. So we'll have a really, um, nice chat. Stefan, good morning. Schön, dass du hier bist. Um, I'm hoping it'll be a few German people here. Uh, my friend Stefan from uh, from Germany is here, who I got to visit when I was there in Germany, checking out, picking up a puppy. Um, and I hope your mom's feeling better. I hope that Marianne a bit better yet. Um, and so let me let me bring Shmuley over and say hi real quick. I'm going to come off camera. Hi, Shmuley. So guys, this here is Shmuley. Shmuley, my. Little Belgian, Belgian Mal, well, I'm going to put him over here so you can see him better. Hi, Schmooze. Schmooly is 11 weeks old on Thursday, and um, he's a very nice dog. He's stolen the heart of Janet and me and some of the dogs. <laughs> um, some of the dogs are still getting really used to him. So um, he's a wonderful, wonderful dog, really, really nice, um, very sweet with uh, Janet and myself, which is critical um, very nice with the dogs. He likes to play a little hard. And we've got Jimmy. He's 13 and a half. Whoops. He's Maya's 13 and a half. Dwayne thinks it's funny. Um, he loves Dwayne, by the way, because um, Dwayne's the closest to his age. And Dwayne is five and a half. <laughs> he's pushing the mic away. Um, and Goofy is closest in relation to him, although they're not related at all, but they're both Belgian Malinois. And he's going to keep pushing the mic away. He says, hey, Dad, pay attention to me, not this crazy mic. So let me give him back to his mom. Let mom take him back, and then we'll continue here. That's his buddy. That's his buddy. That's it. No, he's fine. He just went potty. So, um, so let's talk about some things um, before I see you guys got a lot of questions um, here. Hey, J hey, uh, Sherry, nice to see you guys. Um, I, I want to address questions because I think th this is really going to be about a lot of questions you guys are going to have. So the first and foremost thing... When I bring a puppy into the house, my dogs and my family comes first, right? So um, Janet is in control of the dog as much as I am. She is um, as um, responsible for him as I am. I mean, although he's my puppy, but that dog must listen to Janet, must listen to me. He cannot be mean to the other puppies, or the other dogs, I should say. That's absolutely unpermitted. I do not ever allow that. I always protect my older dogs first. And by that same respect, I protect my puppy. Like, I don't let my dogs pick on the puppy. The only dog that gets to, to correct the puppy is Maya, is a female. Because a strong female will really control a young puppy the best. That's the very, very, very best thing you can have. So all this whining in the background is him protesting in the crate. Um, I will tell you that I will be doing a, um, a series on the puppy that I will make available in the future. In the meantime, I'm posting little daily things on, you know, on YouTube, on Instagram, on Facebook to help you guys understand these little struggles and these little things that I do. And I'll tell you something, it's overwhelming. It's frustrating. You know, there's a lot of times where I feel like, oh my God, it's just so much. You know, last night I got woken up three times by him. Um, but for the most part, he makes it about six hours, you know, without having to go potty. He's very well potty trained. He's only had one accident in the crate, which has been amazing. But um, he's a great dog. You know, I mean, I got very, 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 very lucky as I did with Goofy. Goofy was an is an amazing dog. Um, I found a great, great breeder um, when I found Goofy. And Goofy's 14 years and, what, two months old now. Um, and he's an amazing dog. I couldn't ask for a better dog than Goofy. And I'm hoping that um, Shmuley will kind of fit right into that will be a similar dog. So um, that's 
that's really what I wanted to touch on for the most important part. Um, you know, when I pick a, um, well, first of all, I want to make a decision to get a dog. It's not an easy one. I've been trying to breed Goofy for, how long has it been, honey? Five years? Okay, three or four years I've been trying to breed Goofy. And it didn't take. You know, we could not get a litter out of Goofy. Um, and it's been just circumstance. It, 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 in that position, I say it wasn't meant to be. And then I was looking for a dog, uh, you know, at that time. And now it's kind of, now it's such a later time because now Goofy's 14, Maya's 13, has a very hard time walking. Jimmy's 13 and a half. Um, he's slowing down, but he's, you know, he's doing great. But what it is, physically, it's harder for the dogs, the older dogs, because they can't play with the puppy and they want to, and the puppy wants to play with them. Now for the puppy, sometimes it's kind of good because he learns that, hey, I can't just be rambunctious and play around the house. But, you know, things happen when they happen. I remember um, a few years ago, I said, you know, I'll never, ever date again. I was completely done. And then somehow Janet and I reconnected. And I said, well, what was I thinking? You know, this is meant to be. And I said, you know, I'm never going to let you go. And we're going to get married. That's the kind of, like, circumstance that life throws at you. I wasn't ready to get a puppy. And then a friend of mine called me and said, hey, you got to check out this, this litter that's available. And I did. And I talked to the breeder and I flew to Germany and I met the puppies and I talked to Janet about it. And I said, this is just exactly what, you know, we've been looking for. And so anyway, we went with that. Um, the most important thing I want to stress here, and this is the most critical thing in a puppy, especially a working line puppy. And he is a working line dog is I don't make any presumptions on my dog right? People say, oh, I'm getting this dog. I'm going to go to the world championships. And he's got the genetics. He could do it. Or they say, I'm going to make this dog a service dog, you know, or whatever, whatever that presupposition is. And it's something that I've never done. I don't do it. The only goal I have with my dog is to raise a really nice, happy, well-balanced dog. That's it. Beyond that, everything is just icing on the cake. I, I'm happy. Janet's been doing agility for, God, I don't know, 12, 13, plus, maybe more years, 15 years. And, you know, one day she said, why don't you just run with Jimmy? And I did. And, you know, it was one of the happiest things I've ever done with a dog in my life. And I've done a lot of things with dogs, a lot of sports, a lot of activities. But just the joy of Jimmy trotting around this agility course and me going with him, and I learned some things from Janet and from her teacher, Melissa, and I was like, God, this is really fun. Because, you know, when you step off of an obedience field, unless you took first place, you're beating yourself up. You're saying, oh, why did that happen? And you're, and you're upset with your dog. Why did you take that jump crooked? Why did you sit crooked? You know, all these crazy cockamamie things. You run off an agility field, even when it was a mistake, your heart is racing, you're still happy. You know, there's times I ran off an agility field with Jim, and we didn't do 100%. But you know what? He gave it 100%. And that's really what dog ownership should be about, right? You've got to just love that dog. And that's really the crux of everything. So um, that I will tell you, that my goal with him is to have a very happy, very social, well-balanced dog, exactly like I did with Goofy. Now, Goofy did really great in obedience. He did good in trick dog stuff. And he did okay in protection. He got to his level one. But... Back in those days, I ha did not have access to great trainers. And this is what 99% of people in the world, or I should say 99.99% of people in the world who do protection sports fall victim to. You don't have good trainers. And if you don't have good trainers, do what I did. Quit. Right? I saw what was going on. I used common sense back then. And I said, this is not going to work. And I quit. Because I thought believed and still to this day believe that the welfare and happiness of my dog is more important than any stupid piece of paper, certificate, trophy, plate, or whatever I'm ever going to get, right? So I encourage you to do the same. I encourage you to try different things with your dogs. But if you see trainers who are, you know, I don't want to say gruff, but, 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 you know, but gruff, you know, I mean, you, you might, you, there are corrections involved in dog training. Don't kid yourself and believe they're not. Because if you find somebody who says, we're going to train your dog and we're never going to put a correction on your dog, they're lying. But 
if you find somebody who's just not fair to your dog, walk away, run away, get away, because there's no way that you should put your dog in a circumstance like that. Letting somebody else hold a remote control to your e-collar and seeing them f fry your dog is, you know, crazy. And people do it all the time because they feel, you know, a lot of times people feel like, oh, you know, I'm going to be embarrassed if I don't let this guy do it. Don't. When, when I go to a club, somebody goes, can I hold your e-collar? So I say, no, what are you insane? Of course you can't hold my e-collar. You give them the e-collar, they can turn it up to all the way and just burn your dog just for, for fun. Not that they will, but they can. And some people are not skilled with the tool and may. And it'll destroy your relationship with your dog. So the number one thing for you is focus on the relationship of you and your dog. That's all I want you to really focus on. You get a dog because you love the dog, because you want to do fun things with the dog. What those fun things will be should be determined by both you and the dog, and mostly the dog. Forcing your dog to do a sport, I think is ridiculous. I do. I think it's really crazy. I see people doing it in every sport. And it's not cool. The dog might not be cut out for it. So be fair to the dog. So based on that little rant, I will take correction, uh, corrections. <laughs> I will take questions from you guys. And Janet's sitting here, so she can actually really easy um, uh, block people because we may have to block a couple people. Terrorized, it's 2 a.m. here. I don't know where you are, but 2 a.m. is very, very early. Thank you, for Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, by the way. And those of you who are not aware of my website, robertcabral.com, please check that out. Tons of, I think there's over 200 dog training lessons there, uh, 75 hours of instruction, plus the shelter dog course. Um, really, really good. Angie has a question here. And Angie says, how do I choose the right doctor for my dogs? Last year, I had to put one of my German Shepherds down because of multiple wrong diagnosis and, and co counterproductive medications um, from Germany. Um, well, you know, doctors, they're, they're always practicing medicine. You know, you got to remember that one part that they are practicing medicine. And I would really always get a second opinion. You know, Janet and I are lucky. We have uh, very good doctors, you know, good access to doctors. Um, but you need to really get referrals. You need to ask a lot of people. Sometimes you'll have terrible vets in great clinics and sometimes sometimes you'll have great vet, uh, uh, terrible vets in great clinics and sometimes you have great vets in terrible clinics you got to find the balance because you and you should always make sure you have a specialty center around you because a lot of stuff with dogs that causes the cost their life is um, specialty things cancer um, bone issues orthopedic issues cardiac issues and all that um, let's see I'm only going to um, pick questions that have a question mark in front of them. So please appreciate that because there's 300 people in the room. And if I don't do it that way, then I will not be able to get to anyone. Um, so if you don't have a question mark, like Sherry and Harold here in front of the question, then I will um, not answer it. Sherry says, hi, Robert and Janet. I love puppies. You said I live puppies, but I know you mean you love puppies. Can't wait to meet your new family member. I do have a question and I'll have to send another comment to fit it in. Okay, well then send that comment. Um, I'm trying to find questions, questions, questions. Nobody has a question. So, okay, here's a question. Okay, Croft. I'm going to use this question. Does that make four males and one female in the Cabral household? What do you recommend as an ideal male-female ratio for a small household pack not kenneled should dominant dogs be avoided or is one okay? So, um, yes, four and one. And um, I, I do like a female, a dominant female in the household. And anyone will tell you that who has dogs. My friend Danny Craig has talked about it. Um, Kyle Schwab's talked about it, who has very dangerous and very crazy dogs. Um, what happens is a female kind of runs the show. So if you have one dominant female, she corrects all the dogs and everybody kind of falls into line. You definitely don't want two dominant females. That, that's a recipe for disaster. If you have two females, you kind of want them both to be kind of passive, or you want one of them to be passive, one of them to be dominant. Um, there's no real ratio. I mean, don't overdo it. You know, the fact that we have this many dogs is because our dogs have lived a long time, and Janet um, was retiring Jimmy a few years back and got, a great, got in on a great litter with Dwayne. 
Um, still, I, I, I still, still say this, and I've said it countless times, Dwayne is just a perfect dog, genetically, uh, physically, emotionally, uh, trained-wise. He's just absolutely a flawless dog. He's just the nicest temperament, uh, the most beautiful looking. I mean, he he's great with he's great with the puppy. I mean, he's never once had an issue with the puppy. You know, one little correction, boom, he's perfect. He's just the best big brother. And you know, and Dwayne is the one that I would worry about because they're kind of like both high drive. Goofy's kind of lower drive now since he's older. But boy, uh, you know, if anyone has come out a hero in this whole um, experience of bringing a puppy home, it's the Dwayne Mater. He gets the first prize on that. He did the most amazing. I'm so proud of him. I could cry. I mean, I, I really mean that. Um, just get the right dogs. Don't worry about a ratio. You know, the right, right dogs. Don't bring dominant. Don't bring aggressive dogs in. Be careful. Um, how did his name come to be? Okay. The most common question, the most common question with Shmuley so far has been, how did his name come to be? And I'm going to explain that to you here because I think everyone wants to know that. First of all, I always pick cute names for my dogs, especially a dog like a dog like a German Shepherd, a Malinois, a dominant dog. Now, bear in mind, I had a dog named Silly, who was a Sharpe. That kind of started it. Then I said, um, the next dog I get is going to be a Malinois. It's going to be a tough dog. I'm going to name him Goofy because that was really cute to me. He's a goofy dog. I caught a lot of crap for naming my Malinois Goofy, but he was perfect, and he was goofy, and he lived up to his name. He was kind. He was sweet. He's always been a perfect dog. So when it came time to get another dog, another Malinois, Jan and I talked about it. We had a bunch of different names picked out. We wanted to go with Wiley and then um, um, what was the other ones we had? Wiley was one, right? Um, I know Rammstein, but I said Rammstein I would use if we got a mini dachshund. Um, needless to say, I wanted something that ended in L-E-Y or L-Y or E-Y. So what I did was when I found out this was an I litter, so you have to name your dog starting with an I, so like Iggy, Izzy, you know, uh, Igor, anything like that. None of those names fit. So I named Shmuley I Am Sam. Sam, I Am, Green Eggs and Ham. That's from the Dr. Seuss um, cartoon books. But more than that, I didn't want to call him Sammy because it's a common name. I've heard it quite a bit. So in Yiddish, Samuel or Sam is Shmuel or Shmuley. So it's the Yiddish name for Sam or Samuel, and that's where Shmuley came from. So there you have that. Um, okay, there's a question here, but you don't have a question mark. So I'm going to give it to you anyway. What are the first five things you will recommend and will be teaching your puppy? Well, before I teach my puppy anything, I... Um, focus on building a relationship. I think that's more important than anything else. If you don't teach your dog a relationship and you don't have a bond with them, you're not going to teach them anything. So right now we're walking on a leash, we're going places, we're socializing, we're doing um, fun things, we're meeting people because that's really important. Socialization, I think, is the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth most important thing you're going to do for your, your puppy, especially a dog like a Malinois or a bigger dog that has a higher degree of drive and has some suspicions and stuff like that. And, and, you know, is, is possibly going to be a biting dog, protection dog, sport dog. You really want to get this dog that they like everybody. Like for, at this point, Shmuley, he'll growl at somebody, but as soon as they come up, he, he's, he's all love. And that's normal for the breed. Like to, for the dog to growl and you to not work through that, you're setting your dog up for failure. So socialization, socialization, socialization are the number one things that you're going to do with your dog. Um, again, I'm only taking questions that have a question mark in front. That's it. I'm moving past a lot, a lot, a lot of questions. Um, if you don't have a question mark in front here, okay, I'm going to show you this. This here's a question without a question mark in front. Where should I get my Mal? If you want to get a Malinois, find people who have Malinois, join a Malinois group, join a Malinois club. When you get a Malinois, you want to get it from someone who's bred them before. Now, breeding dogs is not complicated to do. You just need two dogs, and a, and a, you know, and that's it. What I always look for in a breeder is what are they looking at in the dogs? Are they looking at genetic lines? Are they health testing their dogs? Are they temperament testing their dogs? In Europe, they have something called the ZTP, which is a quorum, which is a breed survey 
America, the, the uh, USCA, you know, you know, United States German Shepherd, US German, United Shepherd, it's the German Shepherd Association of America. They also have a breed survey. The breed survey shows the temperament of the dogs, the conformation of the dogs, and if those dogs should be bred. Now, in America, we don't have one for Malinois, and I don't even know if there's any one for any other breeds. If there is, let me know. I'd, I'd be very interested to know. But I think it's really bad. I think it's really bad that people are just willy-nilly breeding dogs, and the AKC is a complete disaster. It's a, it's a, money, it's a money scam. Because you, people say, oh, my dog's paper. I've got AKC papers. It means nothing. Your AKC paper means less than toilet paper because it's not as soft, right? Because that just shows you that two dogs who were AKC registered bred that dog. It doesn't tell you anything about the temperament. It doesn't tell you anything about the genetics, the health testing, or anything like that. You want to look back. Now, I'm going to tell you, you can get a dog that comes from great lines, has great genetic testing, and the parents have a great... Um, breed survey and you can get a bad puppy but it's less likely than if you don't have that so my opinion is try to find some dogs that that are very good that are that are genetically tested that are you know health tested that are bred by someone good and i'll tell you how you know the breeder is good ask them if they'll take the puppy back at any time right both dogs that I got, both of my Malinois, the breeder, both said, if you can't keep this dog at any time, I have the first right. And in my paperwork on both of these dogs, the number one owner of that dog is the breeder and then me. That shows me that breeder stands behind the dog. They care about that dog. And I, I talk extensively to people before I buy a dog, extensively. And Janet researched before she got Dwayne, I mean, probably like three, four, five years before she ever got him. She did her homework. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to get a dog. I'm looking on the internet. I found a dog. Oh, I got a dog. No. I mean, Goofy, I looked for, ye uh, yeah, for years. And then Shmuley, I looked for years to get the dog. So, um, boy, you know, a lot of you are not getting the question thing in front. So I'm just, oh, here's a question. Janine Kurtzinger. Okay, she says, what should I do if my neighbor's Welch Corgi charges at my small standard poodle again? Um, well, <laughs> protect your poodle. I mean, how you're going to do that is going to be up to you. I mean, I would probably start by stomping my feet in front of that dog and making sure that dog is, you know, is scared to go back. I would have a talk with my, my neighbor. I'd consider having a spray bottle because a corgi is not that tough of a dog usually i mean the, the working corgis are but the, the pet ones aren't and i'd have some you know vinegar or something in there and i would spray the dog in the mouth i would make sure that you protect your dog you don't need i mean if a corgi is being aggressive to a little tiny tiny poodle you're going to have a problem so you need to protect your dog and that's your number one job Protect your dog, protect your dog, protect your dog. I would talk to the owner and say, if your dog does this again, I will correct your dog. I will. And I would. Okay, Sherry, here's your question. Okay, Kasia has a lot of energy and prey drive while playing with Rio. She seems to drop it down a notch while playing, training with Harold and I. We have limited Rio and Kasha's time together. Good idea. Yeah, it's a brilliant idea. Because in general, a female is going to dominate a male dog. So Rio, hopefully, will take those corrections and those, those signals, those signs, and will accept those corrections. That's critical, right? And if he doesn't, you're going to have a problem. But yeah, you need to limit the time. I limit the time with this puppy with all our dogs. He can come out. He can run around a little bit. And then when he starts getting to be too much, he gets a chew toy, he goes in the crate or in the X-Pen. That's it. He gets more walks than the other dogs. He gets more training sessions than the other dogs. But my number one goal is to protect Jimmy, Maya, Goofy, and Dwayne. Now, Dwayne can protect himself, but Dwayne is a really good dog. And he's choosing to come to me to go, hey, the schmuck's bothering me, right? So I will step in. Every single time, I don't let anything happen like that because it's not fair that your dogs are watching you sitting there and this young hellion 
coming in and just raising all kind of ruckus. And the puppy doesn't know, right? You, you can't really be hard on the puppy, but you can stop it. You can grab him by the scruff of the neck and go, hey, knock it off. And if he doesn't knock it off, put him in an X-Pen or a crate and let him see the other dogs walking around. Like right now, I've got Jan sitting on my chaise. Dwayne is with her. Jimmy's in the other room. The puppy's in a crate right next to Janet. I mean, he's lying down. Is he lying down sleeping? Sound asleep. Uh, Goofy's over here and Maya's here. Because you know what? The one thing I'll tell you, the more fastidious you hold to your crate training, your routine, your structure, the easier it will be as this dog gets older. Letting him run around and get their yayas out and making him tired like what people think. You'll never get a working dog tired. Never. You need to structure it. Crates are the number one tool for successfully house training a dog. When the dog is out, he's he can have a couple minutes to run around or he's going to go in the X-Pen. He's going to go there. Oh, well, it's not fair to the dog. It is fair to the dog because if the dog runs around and chews on something, um, okay, have a good workout. Um, chews on something or does anything like that, the dog's going to get hurt or he's going to get in trouble and you don't want that. Structure, structure, structure. And when you're doing your training, that's when the dog gets their interaction. Um, okay. Dream or here, uh, you, you put a question down, but um, oh, it's not a question anyway. All right. Looking for questions with a question. If you have a question mark, a question mark before the question, it's the only way I'm going to answer it like this. Look here, Joan. Okay. While looking at the puppies in the litter, what was the deciding factor that caused you to pick your puppy? Great question. So I went, there was 12 puppies. Now, I was fortunate enough to be able to choose from 12. Usually the best thing, I mean, oftentimes the best thing is to have the, the, if, the if you trust the breeder, is to have the breeder choose the dog for you because they're going to know you, they're going to know um, what you're looking for. And if they're honest, they're going to give you the best dog. I was very, very lucky. The breeder allowed me to choose my puppy. But I said to her, even still, I said, bring it down to three or four dogs and let me choose from them because I don't want to choose from 12. And she's been living with them since day one. She knows the dogs. And I think I was there at about six weeks of age. And I asked my friend, Danny Craig, what am I looking for? And I trusted Danny because I, I love Danny. Danny's an amazing guy. He bred some of the nicest Malinois I've seen. Um, he said, you're going to know when you see your dog. That was the first thing he said. And he said, look for a nice top line, look for a, a confident dog, tail up, walking around, chest out, and all those things. But um, then I asked my friend Oscar Mora, how did you pick your dog? And he said, well, I had the breeder bring two, the two that he, the breeder should have you know, wanted him to have or was suggested for him. And he said, one was cr a crazy hellion doing everything, and that was the one the breeder was suggesting. The other one was super chill, just was laying there, and he picked that one. And that was a wise choice. And so when I went, there was, I think, three that were in my running. There was a blue collar, a gray collar, and a black collar. And Shmuley's the black collar. And of all the dogs, Shmuley was the one sitting to the side, and he had a beautiful sit, like just a gentlemanly sit, just sat real confident and clean. When he'd walk around, his tail was up, chest is out, just a swagger about but he didn't really play with a lot of the other puppies. And I like that, right? I don't want a doggy dog. I don't want a dog that has to play with other dogs. That's not a dog I like because I want a dog that's going to play with me. Um, the other dogs were a little higher drive. He was a little lower drive, which I liked after you know having seen what Oscar went through when he got his dog. And then... Um, I just played with him a little bit. I, you know, I picked him up, and when I picked him up, I held him out of my arms, and he was very calm. I could put him on his back and hold him. Um, at some point, I'll post those pictures. Um, I didn't post any of the pictures yet from when I was in Germany. Um, and you know, I just had this connection with him. And I went the first day, and I looked, and it was him between him and the gray collar dog. The blue collar dog was just a, a little bit too much energy, which would have been fine if I was. 30 years younger, but you know, I'm, I'm going to be 60 this year. So I wanted a dog that I could easily live with and want to be considerate to my other dogs and to Janet. So I, uh, I went the second day. It was still him. And the third day I went just before, you know, I went back to, um, 
to uh, uh, Amsterdam to get to the airport. And I was like, ah, that's him. I just knew it. It was just a gut feeling, you know. And again, that was going on two things. The ability to do training, sports and stuff like that. And two, the ability to bond with him. But the number one thing, 100%, was my ability to connect with that dog. He and I connected. And I think when you see the pictures of us, that comes through. Um, how do I choose a sport for my dog to enjoy? So choosing a sport for your dog to enjoy means introducing them to many different things. Now, first of all, you're going to have to see what your dog, you know, wired for. Now, if you have a, a, a Newfoundland, you know, then your a Newfie is not going to want to do agility. That's just that. Um, if you get a dog like, um, I don't know, so, I mean, I can't think. You know, there's, I, I was thinking sports are very active things. You need an active dog. Like, don't get a bloodhound and try to do dock diving. But find where there are all these different sports, right? And if you already have a dog, take your dog to those places. Put your dog, make sure you have a crate in your car, and go watch and then ask the instructor, hey, can I bring my dog out and see how your dog likes it? Um, you know, dog diving is great. Nose work is great. Barn hunting is great. Um, agility is great. Um, if you have a, a, a dog like a Malinois, German Shepherd, Dutch Shepherd, any, Rottweiler, Doberman, anything like that, the protection dogs are, are great. But find a really nice club and find a really good instructor that's going to be fair to you and your dog. And depending on where you are, if you don't have it, just just you know do some obedience with your dog in your backyard in the park. You'll have a great time. I just bumped on this. Athens, Greece. That's pretty fantastic. Um, by the way, guys, 350 people in the room. This is the most people we've had, I think. Um, do me a favor. Make sure you go outside. Give the video a thumbs up. Do not forget to subscribe to this channel. When you subscribe and you hit the notification bell, you will be notified of any live coming up and all new videos I update. And right now, I'm updating pretty regularly with shorts and reels um, with a puppy. So be sure to check that out. Okay, question goes out to... Who's on Facebook? Nice to see Katarina. Katarina says, what age do you recommend to introduce e-collar to a dog? I will be adopting my foster German Shepherd who is nine months old now. He is a dog. He's dog reactive. I am doing engagement training, da, 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 positive reinforcement. First, redirecting before introducing corrections. Well, that's exactly what we should be doing. When I introduce an e-collar to a dog is, one, when I need the tool, right? I mean, I might introduce it early on, like let's say six, seven, eight, nine, ten months to kind of see, just make sure the dog is familiar with it, that it's not something I'm just going to put on the dog's neck and start shocking him. Because in a lot of ways, I can use an e-collar at a low-level stim for little things like little um, taps on the shoulder, you're over there, I'm asking you to sit, you're standing and looking at me, I can tap and you can sit. Yeah, I can use it for that. I can also use it for, you know, cracking across the head and saying, hey, do not do that. Like running up to another dog, correction, hey, and come back to me. Um, I don't really like to use e-collars on dogs if they're not really mature. And I think it's the same kind of thing. And I heard Dave Latham, the British gun dog trainer, and Nino from STS Canine talk about this. People always take puppies and they try to get them to sit down, stand, sit down, stand, stay, the, the, all these things. And over the years, I found that these people were right. When you have a puppy, you want that puppy free and moving and happy. You want them rambunctious. You want them to be, you know, to be having fun, to want to do things with you. When you start introducing static exercises like down, stay, you know, blah, blah, blah. What you do is you get a dog that's being kind of like squashed. And although it's important to do those things, if you have a working dog and you want to do sports with the dog, you need an open, free dog to do those things. So introducing things like e-collars and prong collars and stuff like that, I'm not against those tools. I will use them on every single dog that needs them. No matter what, I will always use them but I determine if a dog needs them. There's been more situations in my life that I've taken e-collars and prong collars off of dogs to train them than, than put them on. Because most people right away run to it as a, as a default. Just like people run to a default of, you know, if the dog's not listening, they try to get the food or they shake the food bag or something like that. That's ridiculous. 
the dog must listen to you, right? And if the dog doesn't listen to you, he must be made to listen to you. And if he listens to you, he should be rewarded for listening to you. But he shouldn't be bribed in order to listen to you. That's critical. Um, let's see here. Here's a question. Stephen Forsyth. Are you absolutely in love with your new puppy because your reactions look like you are? Yes, I am absolutely. I am absolutely in love with my new puppy. But I'm not, I don't put my puppy above my other dogs because that wouldn't be fair, right? And I know the, the breeder I bought him from, she was so happy to know how much I love my older dogs. Because every breeder who's worth anything, but a great breeder especially, is going to look at how you treat your older dogs because they want to know their dog is with someone who's going to care for that dog, love that dog, and cherish that dog until their last day. I was just texting yesterday with Tasha about a Goofy, and you know, and Goofy and one other dog, the one she kept, are the only ones left from the litter. He's 14 years old. It's an amazing thing. And when I found uh, the breeder, Anne, that I bought uh, Shmuley from, she reminded me a lot of Tasha. You know, she was in Germany, Tasha's in California, but they, um, they're they both very, very lovely women, and I do like female breeders. I think they're always, there's something about them. There's a, a strong woman breeding, a strong bred dog is, I think, a lot better choice than, um, than a guy breeding them because for the most part, a lot of guys are too gruff with the dogs. The women let them get away with it, but they, they're able to, st- they, they just do a better job. That's it. That's just a woman's... Uh, place there it's just so much i'd much rather buy from a female you know a woman who who bred a litter a, a strong woman not you know, not just any woman but yeah um neil says what do you what do you do when you are out with your puppy and people walk up and ask if they can pet your puppy archie says hi so i'm going to tell you with my dog at this point in this early, early phase, he says hi to everybody. At this phase, in my puppy's development, he's 11 weeks old on Thursday, he says hi to everybody. Because he already has a little thing in him where he goes, and he growls. He's not sure. right? That's not a bad thing. But you can certainly turn it into a bad thing. right? So if he growls, and then people just pet him, he's like, oh, that wasn't that bad. I want him to know that every single person that he sees means him no harm until we introduce the protection work. And then um, I'm going to rely on my friend Oscar Mora for that because I think he's really incredible at it and he's very close to me and we're very good friends. And we will introduce it um, through his methodology but also through the methodology of um, Team Heuwinkel to Connie and Peter Scherk, good friends of mine in Germany. Um, I'm working with them online. Because I want to give the dog every chance to do the sport if that's what he wants to do. And I want to do it the right way. So early on, this puppy should be handled by every... Okay, so now when I say everybody, I mean everybody who is dog savvy. Like I don't want to just put my dogs in a dog in the hands of somebody who's not going to... Um, who's really awkward with dogs or doing something stupid with them. That I won't do. But... I kind of control it a little bit, and I can always call my dog back, hey, have some cookies with you, and say, hey, come on, let's go, and then we leave. So right now, that's the phase. Now, later, I'm going to decide who gets to meet my dog, right? I'm going to, we're going to say, can I pet your dog? I'm going to say, oh, my dog's training, and I'm going to teach him not to go to those people. But during these early phases, really just let your dog be handled by as many safe people as possible. I think it's really important. Um, dreamer. Okay, what do you feed your dogs? My shepherd started having skin issues at eight years old. Should I be making my own? Well, making your own food is obviously a really, really great idea. And we've done it for years, for years. Now, recently, um, we've had some issues. Jimmy's had some stomach issues. Um, Maya's had some stomach issues. So believe it or not, I put them on a, um, I think it's a science diet or something. It's a gastrointestinal food. Um, I was feeding Goofy raw, but he wasn't eating it. He was losing a lot of weight because he's got a heart issue. So I asked my good friend, Danny Craig. Again, I defer to people that I trust immensely. Danny Craig is one of those people 
that I trust immensely. He's, I consider him a very close friend of mine, and he's been so helpful for me my whole life um, with Goofy. So I said to him, I said, hey, what do you feed your dogs? And he said, you're going to die when I say this, Costco, salmon and uh, sweet potato food. And that's it. So that's what the puppy's on. That's what Goofy's on. Goofy's done what, great getting his weight back. His poops are back to normal. Um, there's always treats. There's always some good natural treats in there as well. Um, you can put some, you know, put some raw chicken, some raw meat. I also give Goofy some cooked meat in there too. But um, that's what we're feeding. Okay, Jerry says, new eight-week mal owner here. How did you survive the first few nights? I had the first night last night with him, and it was brutal. He stopped crying at 2 a.m. Well, that's not that bad. The first few nights with the dog are what's going to determine the right and the wrong, right? Who's in charge? Um, the first night with him, he cried a lot. I, he went potty. I put him in the crate. I have a baby monitor. I always use a baby monitor. That's audio and video. So I have it in the other room with, with us when we're in, in the bedroom. And I can hear him. And if he's moving around, moving around, it's fine. When I hear kind of a... <laughs> that kind of a sound i think it's got he's got to go potty so i automatically i get up i open the uh gate door i don't i make sure he sits first i take him we go outside if he goes potty right away good boy ton of reward verbal reward no treats and then we come back and i throw a couple of kibbles in the crate i put him back in the crate i cover the crate now then he can hem and haw as much as he wants like i don't care right for a couple hours but luckily i got him at 10 weeks so at 10 weeks the breeder had already started doing a lot and the reason i couldn't get him for 10 weeks because he was coming over from germany um the breeder had already done a lot of work with him so he was already predisposed to understanding it but the first night great the first few three four five nights he did fantastic you know he had a little bit of grass one day and he puked a little bit no big deal wiped it down gave him a little bath no big deal um then um last night was a little bit hectic last night he was because i fed him a little extra because we did a lot of training so I thought he had to poo for sure. Three times he woke me up. I went up. Same, it was the same routine. I get up, go out, let him go outside. He potties. He runs around a little bit. A couple more kibbles in the crate. Boom, crate doors closed, cl covered up again. Wait a few hours for him kind of th where I think he's got to go. And now all three times he did pee and then went back in the crate. And he pooed this morning. So he, I think he can kind of hold his poo through the night as long as he has a chance. I watched the dogs. Like what time did they pee and poo last before I put him in the crate? And then when do they pee and poo in the morning? So you kind of get on some kind of a schedule with your dog and know when they need to go out. But you gotta you gotta sit out, you know, and hold out on the crazy screaming. And it's hard to do. It's really hard to do. That's why I suggest a baby monitor, because you can turn the volume down, you can be in your room, you know, across the house or upstairs or downstairs, and you can kind of look, and if you see him doing something that's dangerous, like you know, trying to bite the bars or tearing a bed apart, then you can go downstairs and control the dog. But if you just see him kind of pacing around and doing whatever, you know, okay, he's just trying to, he's, he's like a baby crying themselves to sleep. Um, <clears throat> let's see. <coughs> Excuse me. Nice to hear that you're training with um, Jamie Penrith. Love Jamie Penrith. Okay, Adam Robert. How do I introduce a newborn human and three-year-old dog? I want the dog to have a positive association, but not get overly excited. Well, first of all, when I introduce a dog to a newborn, I don't introduce a dog to a newborn ever, never, ever, ever, never, right? The newborn is in the house. The dog can smell him, see him, hear him, and everything. The dog knows he's there. A nose to nose introduction does not have to be. I would let the dog, put the dog in a crate, or, or if the dog is well-trained, have the dog laying on the ground, and I would be holding the newborn. I would sit with the newborn. I would hold. And if the dog comes up to sniff him, just push him away. Just pet your baby, you know, collar, whatever you do, you know, stroke your baby. And make sure that dog knows that that's your baby. And um, that's the way I introduce the puppy, too, by the way. I bring the puppy in. I hold him. And one by one, the dogs come up. No, it's going to be different because the pep, the dog and the puppy are going to play. So I hold the puppy in my hand. I let the dog sniff it. And then I start by letting him down with the calmest dog. I keep an eye on him. And then um, one by one, I'll, sh I'll sh do a video on that when I do this puppy course. Um, I show the puppy getting more and more freedom with the other dogs. That's really, really important. I do it slowly. But with a baby, 
Just let the dog see the baby's there. Smells it, hears it, sees it every day. It doesn't have to be face-to-face with it. It doesn't have to, quote-unquote, meet it. Yes, Goofy is alive and well. Um, let's see. I'm looking through here. Jackie. Okay, we're 15 more minutes in this. So, And thank you for the question mark. If you see the question mark here, you'll know why I'm answering the question. I, don't answer, I can't answer questions without a question mark. Okay, Jackie says, Hi, Robert. Congrats on the new one, on the new pup. Curious on what you look for when selecting a puppy from a litter at five to six weeks. I'd be looking for a second working German Shepherd next year for a force of obedience and protection work. You got to go on what you go on, right? You got to have a solid breeder. You got to know the lines of the dog. You got to know those lines you want. You got to meet the parents. You got to meet the breeder, talk to the breeder, really ask her what she's expecting out of this litter she will know by the time they're five weeks old the the breeder kind of knows where these dogs are heading what they're going to be like although that might change but she has an idea those are questions i have then when i meet the dogs i look for one that meets you know kind of one that suits my personality it might not be the best looking one it might be the best looking one i don't know you know when i went and picked this guy janet said don't pick one that looks like goofy and that was the best advice because Shmuley and Goofy look nothing alike. Nothing. They're absolutely the most different dogs you can possibly imagine. Because um, I don't want one to remind me of the other. I just find that to be a bad thing. Because especially as much as I love Goofy. So they're very, very different. In, in, in all their personalities, they're very, very different. Um, let's see here. Deanna Anderson. Okay. What do you feed your dogs? I'm waiting to get... F- away from kibble i was looking for trying something that is pre-made because i just don't have the time to make. you know look at sherry uh sherry's naturals which is prey dry provisions um she makes a great food it's a it's a it's a raw beef and some other uh, she does other proteins as well it's cut up and it comes with a little powder that you mix with it's fantastic we use it for years right now i'm not using it but i'll be going back to that with shmuley for sure um let's see john I have a four-month-old Labrador. I have a four-month-old Labrador retriever that I bought home or brought home at nine weeks old, and she gets really excited when we walk past another dog. How can I make sure she stays polite when walking on a path? Well, you just keep moving, right? You just let her see that, hey, we're moving. Boom, I'm moving. It's the same thing with Shmuley. He starts growling at a dog or looking at a dog. I just move. Boom, I'm going. And he follows me. When you catch up, oh, that's a good boy. Come on, let's go. And I don't make it like, no, don't, don't, don't bark. Don't do this. Don't do that. We have a neighbor who does that. That's just reinforcing the bad behavior. Movement, 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 movement. The dog should need to be with you. That's really critical. Um, let's see. Um, I don't see question marks. So if I don't see question marks, I can't answer. I can't take the question here. C. Rogers. My male two-year-old, you know what, it's funny, I have glasses, I haven't even put them on yet. My two-year-old male German Shepherd is coming into his own. How do I minimize his dominant tendencies as he grows into our pack of four? Dozer is starting to react to our dominant rescued female, Kia, and his dad, Zeus. Well, you control the dog. You make sure the dog understands that you're in control, that you're not going to let those things happen that you're going to be the leader of, of the household. That's it. Dogs understand that real clearly. A good firm correction or two. I mean, honestly, if you have an 18-month-old dog and you haven't had what I call the come-to-Jesus meeting with, with him, you know, where you've corrected him at least once or twice, especially with a dominant dog, you've got a bigger problem than I can help you with here. I mean, it's really a much bigger problem than I can help you with. You need to make sure that that dog understands you're in control. And if they don't, you're going to have a serious, serious, serious problem. Um, let's go. Um, GSD means German Shepherd, by the way, for, for the person asking. Okay, Daniel Butler. Good. See the question marks? Gets an answer. Daniel says, curious, which temperament evaluation process do you use for a Mali? We use APET for bullies, but I assume that wouldn't work well for them. You know, I don't think there is a, st- a standard evaluation. In Germany, there's the, the core, the ZTP, 
um, which I wish uh, I wish the United States would put a put a core in for Malinois. I really do. Now, interestingly enough, that's not to say that there's not backyard breeders breeding Malinois in Germany. They are, but just I wouldn't buy one. I only want a papered dog. I want a dog that is papered. I want a dog that is. Um, the, the parents went through the quorum. I want a dog that's approved by somebody. I talked to my friends, Connie and Peter, ask them. You know, I, I want information that can help me make a decision. That's critical for me. And papers and, and health checks and, and all that mean something to me. I could end up with a dog that has health issues, but I rolled the dice and I, 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 I hedged my bets. I didn't just roll them blindly. Right? So... Um, that's critical. Okay, Manish. Pup at seven months old. How do, how do I stop nipping? You don't. He uses his mouth to let us know that he has to go potty. It's not hard, but it's annoying. Well, just take the puppy's mouth off of your leg, off of your leg, off your leg. And what you can do if the dog gets really obnoxious, well, you can take two fingers, pop them across the nose, and say, hey, hey, knock it off. And when he stops it, Praise him. Give him some good boy. That's a good boy. Make sure you ping pong, right? So corrections, rewards, corrections, rewards, corrections, rewards. But um, but don't, you know, yank it out of his mouth and don't yell at him. I mean, those are things. The puppy's just trying to communicate with you. It's like a baby, you know, scratching your face. You wouldn't smack him in the face. You would grab their hands and go, hey, easy. And that's the same thing with a puppy. I grab their snout and go, hey, easy. Or I tap him on the snout. Hey, easy. Um. Let's see. Again, only question mark questions. Beverly from Facebook here. Beverly says, when choosing a trainer, do we look for one who knows about the breed we have? For example, we have a Bernese and he does not do well with harsh tone. Our trainer is supposed to work with the differences. My biggest fear is ruining our dog with the wrong training. He is my heart. Thank you. So when you go to choose a trainer, it's not important that the dog, that the trainer knows your breed. Right, but it's important that the trainer is intuitive to the needs of the breed that you have, and that's important. Right, that's really important. If a trainer is just specialized in Bernie's dogs, Bernie's Mountain dogs, and he's not specialized in anything else, he's going to go broke. Right, unless you have a trainer specialized in German Shepherds or Malinois or Pit Bulls or something, those are like really popular, popular breeds. I would go for a breeder who is empathetic to different breeds, to the needs of different breeds, who understands the dog. Like, you can have a Bernese Mountain dog who is very, um, you know, hard, or you can have one that's very, very soft. That you can read early on. And a breeder, a breeder, a trainer, who can read that and a trainer who can work with that is going to be a better trainer than just one who claims to specialize in a particular breed. Ask for referrals. I would. Um... Okay, Bob Raymond has a question here. Congratulations, Robert and Janet. I get my puppy in six days. Well, thank you so much, and congratulations to you. Ed says, Robert, hi, my 16-month-old Rottweiler puppy has a flashy obedience and should be ready for his BH within a few months. BH is a, is the um, behavior test that's used in the USC and, and, and uh, AWMA and different organizations for working line dogs. However, he is just not interested in chasing and biting the bite pillow, showing lack of reduced prey. Should I wait and work with us defense? I think you I mean with his defense, which I'm sure he will develop an age um, or a band of protection. Well, I mean, you don't necessarily want to work the dog in prey, right? That's the old way of doing it, you know, working the dog more in a defensive manner, um, although that's not even the right word anymore, it is in a more of a possessive manner, um, is thought as being better. The, the prey is an old way of just getting the dog all jacked up, and it usually doesn't work from what I've read. Again, I'm a big fan of the sport. I've read a lot about the sport. I've watched a lot of the sport. Um, I've done a little bit of the sport, but I'm by no means an expert. It'd be a question I would ask to, you know, to uh, Peter Scherk, to uh, Frank Phillips, to Oscar Mora, to these kind of people, because that's what they do. But don't give up on it just yet. That, that, that would be my thing. Don't give up on it just yet. 
Um, Dave, Lisa, Nguyen, are your are all your dogs mouths? If so, do you think it makes a difference? No, all my dogs are not mouths. I have two mouths and a German Shepherd, and Janet has two Labrador Retrievers. So um, that that's not. I don't know where you got that. They're all mouths. Geo. Okay, what were you looking for in a dog when you found Shmuley? Your pick of the litter. I was looking for a dog. You know, when I pick a dog, for me to pick a dog, it has to be a connection. I consider it similar to the, my friends um, or a spouse or something like that. I want a connection. And I think that connection, sometimes it's just not definable by words. It's just something that happened. When I saw Shmuley, he was sitting in a corner by himself, just standing there looking up. You know, he was the one that was always hanging out with the, 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 the girl who bred him. He was always trying to climb in her jacket. He was always the one that avoided uh, the conflicts in the, in the pen. But he had a very self-confident but very reserved way about him. And I liked that. And I liked the way he looked. He was, he was smaller than the other ones. Um, I thought that was kind of cool. So, um, How do I get him to stop jumping on people? Well, first of all, it's something that's done early on. But it's just done by over and over telling him no, you know, no, just popping the leash. Hey, 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 hey. And when he's sitting, he gets petted. Now, this dog is not as high in drive for those kind of jumping things, but he likes to climb in your lap. But it just takes repetition, repetition, repetition. Okay, I got one more, two more minutes. Okay. Claudian, Claud, Claudina. I think I'm saying that right. What to expect from a three-month-old Malinois puppy? When should I start training? Well, you should start training a young Malinois day one, but the training is different. In other words, it should be based on um, building a relationship first, getting the dog socialized, getting the dog out, getting their used to people, getting their used to environments, because that's stuff, you can't go back and fix that, right? You can go back and do obedience, you can go back and do protection, you can go back and do tracking, you can go back and do all these things. You can never, ever, ever go back to the puppy phase, right? You can never go back to that place where that dog is a puppy where he's trying to figure out what's safe and what's not, what's dangerous and what's not, what's friendly and what's not, what's good and what's bad. Those are things that you want to tackle early on. Um, I had to leave him in Germany for the first 10 weeks because he couldn't fly until he was 10 weeks old, and I paid the breeder extra to get him out to socialize and to bring him around tons of people, tons of environments, and she did that. And it was really the best money I ever, ever, ever spent because he'd known her since day one, right? He knew her since he was born. He trusted her. So for her to bring her, him into that environment was priceless. For him to give her to me, him, for her to give him to me, and then him not knowing me, and then I'm exposing him to those things, that's confusing, right? So I mean, my new mindset is this is a much better way to go. Now, before you expose your dog to things that are scary, you need to have a bond with them. So the first few days I had Shmuley, I mean, he didn't leave. We went around the neighborhood a little bit, but we didn't go anywhere. We didn't go to Home Depot until like day three or four. Remember, though, I met Shmuley when he was about six or so, six or seven weeks old in Germany. So he already kind of knew me. But if you bring a puppy home at eight weeks and then day one you got him outside and you're bringing him to like things with lots of noise and you're new and the house is new and the car is new and the environment's new, the dog's going to break down. You got to build that trust. Hand feed the dog. A lot of hand feeding. Hand feeding, hand feeding, hand feeding. 90% of the feeding Shmuley gets is hand feeding. That's paramount. That's how you're going to build a good dog. That's how you're going to build a good relationship with your dog. Then you extrapolate that out from the house to the yard, from the yard to the neighborhood, from the neighborhood to the park, from the park to the city. And it goes from there. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed this chat. I'm sorry, there's a lot of you here, 300 something people. Um, do me a favor. Give this video a thumbs up if you would. I'd be very kind of you. More importantly, please subscribe to the channel because there's new content coming You know, now almost every other day. And I think it's all stuff you're going to really love. There's over a thousand videos here of great content, great lessons, great Q&As, great podcasts, everything that I hope you'll enjoy. And if you're really interested in learning more about dog training, check out my website, robertcabral.com, for all the best online dog training available anywhere. Thanks for being here, guys. God bless you. Have a great weekend.